Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's panel on crypto mining. My name is Adam Trademan. I'm the CEO of the recently announced SBI mining chip. SBI is a large investment bank in Japan, spun off of SoftBank, and has begun an aggressive operation in mining chip and system manufacturing and uh, production. I'm also the CEO of BRD. You may have seen some of the signs upstairs. And BRD is the fastest growing decentralized mobile wallet company. And today I'm joined by several panelists from the mining industry and the development community. I'll let you gentlemen each introduce yourself, please, and then we'll get some questions. Hi, uh, my name is Jan Čapek. Uh, I'm the co-CEO and co-founder of Brains. Uh, it's the company that's been developing Slush Pool for the past six years. And since last year, we have a new toy called Brains OS, which is our open source initiative for the mining firmware. Okay, I'm so Marco Strang, uh, CEO and co-founder of Genesis Mining, um, and uh, we've started 2013, and uh, our goal was to make mining accessible for everyone, um, while also, of course, doing a lot of mining ourselves, and uh, the Genesis Mining has um, grown uh, to the Genesis Group, where we have also expanded the business from blockchain to also high-performance computing and, uh, and other uh, and other like AI and other digital infrastructure. I'm Matt Corallo. I actually am not as directly involved in mining. Um, I work more on Bitcoin protocol engineering uh, in, as it relates to mining that includes better block propagation, so uh, fiber and before it, the, the relay network. Um, these days, better hash and pushing for more decentralized mining and trying to talk about uh, risks to the broader Bitcoin ecosystem from today's mining protocols and trying to push for uh, better protocols in that space. Um, so a lot of protocol things related to mining, but not as directly kind of involved in the day to day. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. So obviously we're all happy that the spring has come here to the crypto markets and prices are looking good. But the last, what, 18 months or so were a real bitch, right, with the crypto winter <laughs> yeah. and uh, caused a lot, of, a lot of challenges in the mining industry. We've seen some companies come and go. We've seen the big giants like Bitmain struggle. Uh, failed 7 nanometer chips, a lot of canceled projects, uh, a lot of low volumes and shipments. Now, presumably, orders are starting to come back. But as the consumers of a lot of these mining systems, at least for you two gentlemen, who do you see as emerging as the winners in the minor manufacturing space over the next year or two? Do you think it's going to continue to be the likes of Jahan and, and Bitmain, or is it going to be a new generation of companies? Um. The situation in the market uh, has changed a little bit. I think there's more players coming into the industry showing uh, the capabilities to manufacture the chips. Um, well, our ultimate dream, if there was ever some um, open source or some initiative uh, that would be directly connected with the Bitcoin community uh, that would allow sourcing the mining chips for for like, I, wouldn't, I don't want to say like general public, but I mean like general industrial public. So I think the companies that survived, that was like the first part of the question, are the ones that were trying to be reasonable and conservative in their business decisions. So not trying to invest like huge amounts of money into technology that's not proven and that may uh, present a certain level of risk. Uh, like you mentioned, the seven nanometers. Uh, this is not an easy, technology until the EUV stuff is really in production ready in the fab houses, which I'm not an expert on the, on the backend engineering, so I really don't know what the real state is at this point, but we've seen a few failures in this era. Mm -hmm. So these, these were like those kind of uh, risky decisions that should be um, omitted. I also think that there's a, a fundamental change now, as we are seeing like on the chip level, we are really um, coming to a kind of a plateau, so um, as that, uh, and, and there's f further competition coming, so which really stresses on the chip manufacturing side uh, and slims the margin. I think what um, is more and more important uh, is the ability to really have prime, prime uh, hosting facilities and really v highest efficiency infrastructure. And um, 
So I think that businesses that are focusing on infrastructure and main, merely consuming the chips can have a competitive edge when they really have optimized facilities. Um, and of course, like uh, then of course then you have like uh, uh, also hosting companies and also you have companies that are selling the mining as a service to others. Uh, of course, they uh, also there is um, a good um, growth potential on that side. So, yeah. Matt, do you have any thoughts to add? Yeah, I mean, I obviously don't know as much as most of the others sitting on this panel uh, about specific hardware stuff. I mean, I am curious, I don't know if any of you guys have any comments on like the, how much the difficulty of taping out new chips and how much knowledge is required going into seven nanometer, going into these really small fabs, how much that's going to kind of restrict us to not necessarily Bitmain, but other qualified, like, you know, top, top engineering yeah. talent for yeah. chip manufacturing. I've been building chips for about 20 years in the Silicon Valley, at least before I got into crypto. And um, Marco's right, things are plateauing. Like Moore's Law plateaus at these sort of small technology nodes. But what grows exponentially is the cost and engineering skill that's required to build these chips with a high yield and high reliability. And I think this industry, from the mining perspective, you know, was sort of pioneered by a number of companies that for obvious reasons, because time is money, more so in mining than in maybe any other industry in the world, that they just focused on getting things done and getting things done quickly and not really focusing on the long-term reliability. I mean, the idea was that these, uh, these systems were probably going to only have a, a shelf life of a year or two anyway because difficulty was going to keep going up, right? Mm -hmm. But what happened was that these chips came to market with technologies right as sort of that plateau was happening in, in the general chip design industry. And then now people are paying the penalties of investing 20, 30, 40 million to build a seven nanometer chip and having them come back dead or yield at 40 or 50 percent. So what I think is going to happen in that case, Matt, is that you're going to find fewer companies that can do better chip design. And you may start to see some traditional chip and semiconductor companies that have never played in mining before bring products to market. And uh, I, I kind of know from experience right now, since I'm, I'm working with one, that uh, I think it's going to be pretty shocking to the industry when we see some of these uh, long-term, very successful, um, you know, global uh, chip companies coming to market with crypto mining products. So, in my opinion, that's what's going to lead the future. Uh, but these are chip guys. From the from the mining system, you know, perspective, I think it's going to continue to be sort of like what happened in the um, in the desktop or mobile uh, PC space. There's going to be a lot of system vendors using a smaller number of chips. Right? Just like Apple's using, they're leveraging each of their you know, A chips for multiple products now as well. So, so continuing the trend of uh, specialization in the mining field, you've got the right. guy who buys the power, you've got the guy who runs well, the so, farm, you've got the chips, you've got the system. Right. But that could mean, that could mean fewer chips or you know, basically fewer uh, designs, so more reliance on certain manufacturers. Uh, to me, that starts to reek of like mining, at least chip, centralization. Now, I think back to what I was reading in the um, news sites, what, was it a year or two ago, where everybody's complaining that mining is becoming very centralized in terms of operations. What do you guys think about that? Are we becoming more decentralized in our mining today? Are we going in the opposite direction? Where should we be going? I, I think it's actually quite alarming, and uh, it's very good that um, uh, we're talking about that because uh, um, we, we are seeing... Um, an innate, a radical innate drive that basically originates from the um, uh, competitive advantage that the uh, large-scale mining operators have compared to the home miners, and that's on many ways. Like it's not only on um, on the economy of scale; that's a clear one, but also like of course the. Uh, um, the, the electricity, uh, you cannot compare like most of the home miners' electricity compared to the, to the people where they select really the prime spots uh, with lowest electricity. And then also uh, the large-scale players, they have their own optimization tools to drive uh, optimization f further on a machine level right. um, and, uh, and again further um, competitive advantage. So I think this is really an alarming thing. and. Um, 
I mean, uh, I'm really, it's great to see like the community efforts like BetterHash and uh, Ma uh, Matt is driving these um, efforts and uh, I think it's really a serious problem and to my, uh, in my opinion, the, there's too less priority from the community put on that. Uh, but it's also not a, but not a very easy thing to solve because there is this innate um, in, uh, advantage that the l large players have. So I see, for example, uh, us what we're doing on when uh, we are, of course, mining a lot for ourselves, but, we, but when we're selling in the cloud, uh, that is a kind of decent uh, distributing hash rate again, but of course you could say, oh, well, the, the hash rate is still centralized in our data centers, but we are having uh, on our roadmap, we're putting a lot of emphasis on something which we call trustless cloud mining, where we are trying to give away more control to, the, to our customers. Um, but this is also not trivial, but there are ways uh, how, um, how you can the physical access and the physical control to give that uh, potentially uh, and ideally to people at home. Like ideally, for example, a customer at home can, uh, has the privilege to turn the, uh, can only the customer at home with a private key, for example, can run the machine and we couldn't run it with the permission of a, of a, of a miner at home. Uh, ideas like that would be interesting. I think that would be an... Uh, Do you think that's where the hardware is going though? Do you think it's going more towards the individual home hobbyist, or is it going more towards enterprise stuff like you guys want to put in your data centers? Very where you want high reliability, you know, maximum sort of performance. You may pay a little bit more for the right price point in order to get the product that performs the best and lasts the longest. Yeah, well, it will clearly go in that direction. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's the thing, right? I mean, the economical right. advantage where it's naturally going is going very, very heavy towards central. Well, I thought Satoshi set this up the right way, so it wasn't supposed to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, it is. Yeah. It is, it is. But at the and same I'm, time, there's a lot of like, the availability of bottom absolute cheapest power in 100 megawatt chunks, in 10, 20, 50 megawatt chunks, yeah. that's doable. Whereas that's still a relatively small scale in the scale of the Bitcoin network these days. So, I mean, I agree that it is bad how much, um, you know, while professionalism is good, it's, it's bad how much that gives larger miners a little bit more of a competitive edge. But I think there's still it is still a relatively decentralized when you look at mining itself. Now, of course, when you look at pools, this is a different story. But when you look at mining itself, we do have hundreds of players. Not really anyone has more than a percent or two, you know, up to mm -hmm. five in the very absolute largest cases. I mean, of course, you look at pools, we're talking about what, between Antpool and BTC.com, it's like, what, 40, 35 percent of hash power or something like that. Right. Um, it, it, I think when we look at mining, it tells a very different story, and, and you're right, in the long term, I do worry about things becoming a little bit more, you know, as it grows and professionalizes more and stable, and the hardware stabilizes, and we have, you know, more opportunity to really tune these things instead of just time, 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 get that hardware in before anyone else. It, that's concerning how much that might play a role in centralization. But for now, it seems much better than uh, raises significant alarm bells. Uh, All right. I think pools uh, are a whole other question. But I think we're going to see uh, a dramatic shift in uh, the quality standard uh, of the physical equipment, because I don't think the current devices, if we put the side bit free, which is trying to go that way with the, with the industrial miners, the regular miners are, were like original men for like home miners putting them on the shelf. Right. Uh, and if you, if you think about it, like we're trying to, uh, you know, hunt the, 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 the efficiency on the chip level, but nobody really started looking at the efficiency of the, of the device as a whole. Uh, so we may see changes in the form factors, something like, I don't know, rec mount units, whatever, something that would have like very low total cost of ownership. Uh, for example, like we, we're not, we're not uh, uh, like minor in a, in a way that we would be owning a physical equipment, but we're actually gathering uh, the, those kind of concerns from various big mining farms who we actually provide the work with. And they basically say, well, 
uh, today, like if we have like 10,000 machines and they all are like this form factor, it takes like hours and hours of our workers to connect them all and do this, do the servicing. So this this we see as a as a change for the future, uh, the mining going like more enterprisey. And at the same time, I don't think that this is like a really centralization problem because like you you already started um, sort of commenting on this part is that the centralization is not really in the in the in the fires, but the centralization uh, is in, in who is manufacturing the hardware, and, or even more, who is manufacturing the chips. And uh, the problem is that we're touching the cutting edge technology here. And I think there's like three foundries in the world, three companies in the world that are able to manufacture 10 or 7 nanometer chips. So when it comes down to this level, uh, this would be a risk. And I think at some point, Adam Beck tweeted, uh, about uh, Bitcoin price is not there yet, but maybe Bitcoin community may buy um, a foundry that would be used for sourcing the chips so that we're not dependent on, on uh, the standard industrial foundries. Yeah, that but that's like a dream. It's not, we're not dream. quite there yet. <laughs> <laughs> interesting, interesting, interesting. Okay. Well, I mean, clearly there are only a few manufacturers that can compete in that area at the actual foundry level. Supply has always been the bottleneck during price run-ups. You guys order a lot of miners. Are you seeing supply issues right now? Well, I pass this on because we don't order any miners. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the run is big again. Um, times have shifted from uh, uh, where basically everyone was just searching for um, where the miners were very cheap and, right. uh, and people were just looking for any possibility to deploy the miners uh, in a very low cost electricity uh, regions. And now basically, and, and some miners were just floating around, no one used them anymore. And now every, everything is con uh, like everybody grabs all the miners he can and the supply is getting stressed. So um, right now uh, we basically are in a period where um, the demand is growing for mining in general a lot because people just realize they can mine it cheaply uh, rather than, uh, rather than uh, they, they miss to buy so they can still mine it cheap. And, but of course that only lasts until the hash rate catches up again. And now the question is how much miners are there uh, so that the, and how fast the hash rate will catch up again. Um, and that usually comes with a kind of delay, and then it depends on where the price goes yeah. further up or, right. or down. Right, right. Okay. Well, let's, let's switch topics a little bit here. Matt, you don't seem terribly concerned with the uh, centralization, decentralization issue, but I, I think last night you demonstrated a security hack related to mining, and mining security isn't something that we hear talked about too much. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that, and maybe you gentlemen can expound on what you think about security. Right. So. I'm less concerned about the centralization of mining hash power wise, but very much so, very much the opposite when it comes to pools. And not necessarily because I distrust Jan here or any of the other pool operators. There's a, there's a few others who are around, or at least were around earlier today, um, but because they're large targets and because Stratum has no authentication uh, or no cryptographic authentication, especially, but also generally not much authentication. Um, and this makes it a very large target. It's a protocol with, over which transfers something that has significant value, right? If you can uh, hijack pool servers, whether that's physically going to a data center and hijacking it, contacting support techs and compromising them, compromising the servers, doing any number of other attacks. So last night I demonstrated a, a BGP hijack against a, a sample stratum pool. This is another method you can use to steal hash power. Uh, you instantly get a lot of money, right? If you can steal a lot of hash power, you have a lot of money flowing through you that, that you can claim. And uh, these attacks are really not that Weird. We've seen them used in the cryptocurrency space. We've seen them used against pools before, and way back in uh, 2012, against some altcoin pools, uh, against my Ether wallet more recently. Uh, yesterday morning, accidentally, they took down some steel metals manufacturer, took down a big chunk of the internet. Um, you know, these things really concern me because short range, short term attacks are very, very likely today. And, and I mean, you look at mining on strange ISPs, you know, how much does, would you really know if your ISP was taking 1% of your farm's output and changing the username on it and taking the money? 
Probably not. There's not many farms who can say, yes, I would actually be aware of that. Uh, there are some, but not many pay that much attention, right? So it's a great idea, Matt. <laughs> Good business. I'll go start an ISP uh, in rural areas with cheap power. <laughs> Um, but you know, th there's there's a lot of work to be done there, and there's uh, better hash. I know Jan has been working more on uh, things that incorporate some of those ideas and uh, on newer protocol design in that space. But you know, taking advantage of the decentralization inherent in farms today, and not having to change too much about how things operate, still having pools, still having the nice reward splitting, but still getting some security, so cryptographic authentication, and hopefully decentralization around farms running full nodes, mm -hmm. yeah, at least optionally. What do you guys think? Um, can I? Yeah. Um, well, essentially, what, what Matt was explaining, this has been also a concern for us. Um, and actually, we've been uh, working on this together. Uh, and as part of this uh, quality shift, or the changing the, the, the quality of mining to, to a new level that would meet the industrial standards. Uh, it, would be, it would obviously also include uh, fixing or maybe even exchanging the full software stack up to the mining firmware, making it open source, and so on. Uh, so um, I think the community can expect that we would submit a draft uh, of a new Stratum protocol. We call it Stratum V2, which would be based uh, on the better hash ideas and based on the consulting with, uh, with Matt. Uh, and obviously, like all these uh, security concerns uh, would be addressed, including uh, a potential to to have miners, uh, you know, providing their own work to the pool, which would which should prevent anybody trying to run uh, a transaction uh, a censorship attack or something like that. So, yeah, this would be part of the whole industrial package that I think is going to come into into the game quite soon. It's actually being demanded from, from, from the industry anyways. So it's not something that we just made up. Mm. Marco, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I fully agree. I think it's um, uh, a very critical aspect to have that also like, more decentralized on the, on the software side. And um, um, as long as there is progress in the community that addresses that, I think that is Good. Uh, what I'm, I'm, I'm fearing is that sometimes, like these things, are not addressed to, to, to the to to to, um, to a proper manner. But I think this is, uh, yeah, because this is really essential. I mean, if there are vulnerabilities on that on the mining uh, side, I mean, this is a, one of the most fatal uh, element of the whole system. Right. I mean, I think we do have a good opportunity here. Right? We we're talking about the mining ecosystem professionalizing, better hardware, open source firmware. Uh, Hopefully, you know more competition in the, the device manufacturing area, um, even if less in the chip manufacturing. Um, but we have a good opportunity now to get new protocols, better protocols in there, make these things the default for the next generation of miners, because the next generation of miners, at least based on what you guys have been saying, is the one that's going to last. You know, the the miners that don't have a shelf life of nine months, that don't have a shelf life of six months, they're the ones that people are actually going to be running for five years. Uh, so making sure that those miners have these features as a default, uh, you know, are secure, aren't easy to hijack, hopefully enable farms to run their own full nodes if they want to, if they're technically competent, you know, all these wonderful things. Um, so you know, obviously, that's the goal with the Stratum v2 work, uh, which, as Jan mentioned, should be out soon. Um, should be more details of that soon, uh, but you know, making sure that this is something that's demanded by miners, by pools, uh, provided by pools, and, and make sure that that's available for people instead of the default being insecure, unencrypted stuff that we have today. All right, let's switch gears again. Let's talk about the halving coming up, and what are your forecasts for how that's going to sort of impact the mining business, the mining reward halving? Sorry, halving. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Who would like to go first? <laughs> I I think it's a it's a, actually it's a big driver for the mining space because uh, uh, it 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 kind of clears out the space and uh, um, it uh, it's very critical to be like I think the core essence in the mine to be a miner is is from the beginning on and will always be to be 
one of the most efficient miners. Because of the guaranteed supply of Bitcoin, if you are one of the most efficient miners, then you can always make sure that you will continue to operate. Because uh, the, when the profitability goes down, um, people who will, uh, the, the, the less efficient miners will be the one that will be first in the reds and they will then go out and the difficulty will drop and you will remain in, the, in, the, uh, in business. So the uh, halving basically that accelerates that effect and clears out the non not so efficient miners very radically and leaves in the miners that are more efficient. And they can, that doesn't of course, uh, one of the big misconceptions is that everyone will only earn uh, half, of the, uh, half of the profits after the, after the halving, which absolutely, uh, absolutely is not the case. Um, the ones that remain in the uh, space will, will, um, will be definitely compensated by that downtime and a lot of the inefficient miners will be cleared out. Uh, so I think it's a benefit because uh, it drives for innovation. People are, all, they are thinking about the halving coming up. It's one of the main, major topics always in the mining uh, industry and it just... But does it also drive centralization then? Uh, yeah, it's, it drives centralization again. Uh, I think absolutely right. Yeah. Keeps coming back to that, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Jan? Um, I think the halving is going to get uh, included into price in a few months. Uh, it, the price doesn't usually uh, go up like immediately after halving, but it's already accounted before. What do you think is the precipitous? I mean, how does the market auto adjust to? have that price increase beforehand? You think it's just purely psychological from traders? Or, they, you know, is there any, there, there's no way to exert control in terms of supply on the mining side, right? I mean, not selling that much into the daily volume, right? To be able to, to limit things and to try to push the prices up. Well, the, the daily supply of Bitcoin is gonna go, go down. Uh, so people think they could, they should pile up a little bit more Bitcoin before that. Purely but psychological. Thing. Yeah, it's, I think it's a psychological <laughs> yeah, thing before yeah. that. Yeah. Maybe it's happening already. <laughs> Have you seen the markets well, today? Well, <laughs> hard to say. Yeah. What do you I, think, Matt? I, I mean, obviously, uh, the markets seem to anticipate the happening pretty well. Uh, <laughs> we're all kind of pretty well aware of when the happening is going to happen. Uh, you know, I think a, another question is, of course, what happens to the fee market going forward? Exactly. You know, as we're talking about mining, you know, yeah. fees come and go, and fees have, at some points, been a material amount of the block reward, and especially as the block reward go keeps going down or the subsidy keeps going down, you know, what's that fee market look like? Um, and, you know, I'm really curious what's going to happen. Like, when, when are we going to start to see miners speculating, selling futures against the fee market, you know, trying to, to average out their mining reward given unknown market conditions? You know, when are we going to see these kind of com more complex derivative markets around Bitcoin mining to make these farms much more stable income in the face of potentially much less stable income from the actual underlying chain. You're in a unique position to be able to sort of forecast some of that stuff, at least in your mind. Do you want to, uh, you want to make a uh, forecast where you think fees are going to be in a year or two? <laughs> oh, boy, I have no idea. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there, there's a lot of unknowns there, especially, you know, a lot of transaction volume today is yep. just arbitration between, uh, arbitrage between exchanges. Yep. Um, how much of that is going to move to Lightning, Liquid, other systems like that uh, is a huge open question. And how much you know, adoption of things like Lightning is going to uh, drive more on-chain volume as a result of people wanting to use these nicer payment rails versus less on-chain volume because things are going to move off-chain. Also a big open question. I think there's just way too many like, really big open questions to, to have a good forecast. All right, fair answer. We won't force a number out of you. <laughs> so, Jan, you've got a presentation tomorrow as well. Do you want to say a few words before we run out of time on what you're going to be talking about? Sure. I kind of already mentioned that. Uh, the thing with the open source, so I'm going to uh, try to cover the topic of the vanishing open source in our Bitcoin mining, sort of like uh, not your firmware, not your miner, trying to rephrase the, you know, the famous thing with not your keys, not your money, or not your Bitcoin. Uh, and 
I will try to explain basically the little bit of the history, like how we started with like everything being open source and how it slowly shifted. And we have to realize that uh, mining is actually securing the Bitcoin blockchain, so we should really know what devices uh, are doing it and what's in there. I think we're getting played off stage here. Let's go drink. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds drink. like a great idea. Yeah. Great job. Can everyone join me in congratulating this amazing panel?